Welcome back. I hope you had an uh, enjoyable break. It looks like lots of conversations and chats and connections are happening, which is fantastic. And um, that's why that's the benefit of having an in-person side to this meeting. And we hope everyone who is joining us online had a chance to take a break, relax, and decompress after that busy first session. So I am delighted to invite up our next speaker, who I think Michelle introduced in a really fantastic way about the importance of technology. Uh, we are joined by Dr. Hannah Dunbar. Hannah is a consultant, low vision optometrist with over 15 years at Moorfield. Is that? So she is, she, what she doesn't know about low vision isn't worth knowing. Uh, so um, Hannah is also a researcher at the Institute of Ophthalmology, where she is the lead for MacuStar, which is an AMD trial but um, she, she knows so much about macular degeneration and technology uh, to support people with, with macular vision loss. So, Hannah, over to you. Thank you very much. I think I spoke to some people two years ago on a Zoom meeting, and it's really nice to see you this in person again. So, as Andy mentioned, I've worked in the low vision clinic at Morpheus for yeah, over 15 years. And there we see people with all kinds of um, visual impairment through all kinds of different conditions, children and adults. We see a lot of people with uh, star barks as well. So let's just go to the next slide. And the things that I'd like to cover are... <laughs> okay. yeah. So the reason um, I want to talk a little bit about technology is that in that 15 years of working in the low vision clinic, technology comes up more and more and more. Um, and that's because there's been such a big change in what's been available, especially through, first of all, just generic technology. And by generic technology, I really just mean smartphones, tablets, even smart speakers, computers. So I want to make sure that we kind of cover that. I also want to talk a little bit about using speech output. Um, and then a little more about some of the specialist wearable devices that people do ask about quite a lot. We'll go to the next slide. So smartphones and tablets, first of all. Sorry, the slides aren't showing on my screen here, so I may have to just look over. Um, as you probably know, these devices will have lots of inbuilt accessibility features. And many people will have explored some, may not have gone through the whole range. So. I'll try. <laughs> Is there a microphone? Yeah. Yeah. That's easier. Yeah. Is that better? Is it wrong? Andy, do you think the table needs to be moved? Um, okay, so that's better. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, smartphones and uh, tablets. So, they will, these will have lots of inbuilt accessibility features that are already in the device. So the beauty of this is that you don't have to buy anything new. So of course you may know that you can adjust the, the default font sizes in these devices. Now, unfortunately, though that changes the settings in uh, most of the menus on the phone, it won't always default over onto the different applications that people can download. So there is usually another setting in there called zoom or magnification where you can zoom everything within the phone screen. And interestingly, a lot of people seem to have missed that when we speak to them in clinic. Of course, you can also use these devices as electronic magnifiers because they've got cameras within them. So you can image something and enlarge that. The beauty of it is it works both at close range and for distance because mostly it will have an adjustable focus camera. And many of these devices will actually allow you to apply different filters to the image so you can reverse the contrast, or if you prefer to have a different color combination for contrast, that's often always available as well. Now, of course, there are some really great standalone devices that do this type of electronic magnification as well. People need that dedicated piece of equipment. And actually, we've got a few outside on the associated optical stand. So I'd really encourage people to go and have a good look at those as well. Now, of course, if you're using these visual accessibility features, devices that have a larger screen tend to be better because you can, you can magnify more and not lose the context of the screen so much. And then even simple things like adjusting the screen brightness can be considered an accessibility feature to make things visually more acceptable. So if we go forward, 
they've also got some speech output options. Now, I think sometimes a lot of people think that when we talk about speech, we're saying, oh, don't use vision, just use speech. But that's really not the case. It's a question of being able to opt in and out of this feature if you want. But of course, some people will rely more fully on speech and these devices will have software already inbuilt, which we'll go through later as well. And of course, less on the sort of accessibility feature, but just productivity things in, in phones and devices. You'll have um, voice assistants that you can speak to like Siri. Of course, you can put your electronic books or newspapers on these devices and make use of all the accessibility features, including speech. And then of course, you can have your audio books and even podcasts. So if we go forward again, I want to talk about some different applications that people might put on these devices. So the accessibility features that I've talked about already are there to help you access the standard apps and, and settings, making calls, all the things that these devices do. But there are also apps that might sort of um, increase that functionality further. So I've broken them into three different topics. The first one is AI applications or artificial intelligence. So Two really great ones to know about are Microsoft Seeing AI and Google Talkback. These are both free to download and free to use. Microsoft Seeing AI is only on Apple and um, Google Lookout is on Android. So if we go to the next slide, these devices tend to have sort of common features, or sorry, these apps have common features, but essentially what they do is they use the camera of the device that you've got the app on, and they apply artificial intelligence to the image captured by the camera to, eat, to describe the image or describe certain features of the image. And they'll break that into different channels. And these two apps have quite common channels. And then Seeing AI has some uh, additional ones that I'll tell you about. So the common channels, let's just talk through how you might use these. So if you had a small piece of text, a label, a poster on a wall, something that you wanted to get access to the print on, you can use the short mode or short text or text mode option to image that text. So take a live view of it through the camera and that any text there will be converted to speech for you to listen to. Now, if you've got a whole document, it might not be sensible to do that through a live feed through the camera, which case you would use the document channel. And this allows you to take an image of the whole document before then it being converted into speech using uh, AI. There's also a currency mode. So this essentially is if you had some paper banknotes and you wanted to understand what they were, that can be imaged through the camera and told to you. Of course, it won't work across all international currencies, but most of the major ones are covered. It's also got a product or food label option. So this is scanning the barcode on a device to be able to tell you the information that has been stored in that barcode. So that could be, you know, what is the product? What's the weight of it? It really depends on how much information has been stored in that barcode. And then there's a scene or explore channel where really this is about just taking an, an image of the scene around you and having that described. If we go to the next slide, then we've got some unique channels for seeing AI. So they've also got a person mode, so it can tell you whether people are in the, are in the feed of the camera. It's got a handwriting setting to read handwriting. But of course, this will depend a little bit on how neat the handwriting is in the first place. It's got a color option, so it's trying to tell you what color it can see in the camera, but in experience so far, it's not very good. It doesn't do a great job on that. And then for people with very, very limited vision, it's got a, a light detection mode where it will produce an audible sound to give you the direction of light, and the sound will increase as you get closer to the light. Now, very recently, they've added a new channel to CNAI, and that's called the World Channel. And this is only available so far on new Apple devices that have LiDAR functionality. And essentially what it does is it gives audio augmented reality. So if I were using it and I were taking an image of what's in front of me now, the AI would be able to tell me that there's a door, would announce the word door, but it would announce it in the direction through 3D audio uh, earphones from where that door is. So it's giving a sort of Imagine building up a picture of the world through uh, audio signal as well. Now, not um, it hasn't come out yet, but I think where these where these apps are going to go in the future is they're probably going to look to collaborate with this new AI chatbot technology that everybody's talking about. So, ChatGPT. So, 
I don't know if people have been following the media at the moment, there's been a lot of talk about this. They've recently, I think just this week, announced that there's a new version where it can decode images. And already some of the um, site assistant applications have team starting to team up with chat GPT and open AI, but this is in beta testing at the minute. So that's where I think that technology is going to move in the near future. If we go to the next slide. Next slide. Thank you. Um, these are a couple of virtual assistants or sighted assistant applications. And just on that chat GPT point, Be My Eyes has actually already announced that they're going to be working with chat GPT. So these applications, Be My Eyes and Ira, they both allow the user to connect with someone on video call to basically give sighted assistance. Now, they're both both apps are free to download, but Be My Eyes is free to use as well, whereas Ira is actually a subscription service. So there's similarities and differences again with these. So if we go to the next slide. So with Be My Eyes, as I say, you're connecting through the video call. So if you place a call through Be My Eyes, a volunteer will answer that call. And when they answer it, they're gonna see what the, your back facing camera is seeing. So you're able to use that to then communicate with the volunteer and ask them to be your sighted assistant. So can, can you just borrow their vision for a moment, ask them a question that has a visual answer, you give them their answer, you help where you can, and then you end the call. Now, some people don't like the idea of asking volunteers. Um, I think it is worth saying there are many, many, many more volunteers than there are users. So you're never, don't think of it as hassling a stranger. The call will bounce around until it's picked up by the next available volunteer. These are all people who have signed up. So they have shown the initiative that they want to be involved in this. Um, and if they're not able to answer, someone else answers. So, you know, please don't mind about asking um, for assistance in this way. But it's important to know that these are volunteers. They're not trained. They're not security checked. So you don't ask them to help with things like reading your bank statements or doing your online banking. But it is maybe a useful app just to have there downloaded. Not You may not use it all the time, but just on that odd occasion where it would have been handy to have someone that you could just ask to borrow their vision briefly. Now, Ira, as I say, does a similar thing, except that you don't connect with a, set, with a volunteer. You connect with an employee of Ira, and they call, oh, let's go to the next slide. They call the, um, the trainers um, visual interpreters. So these are people that are hired, they've been trained, they've been security checked. This service is available in the UK. It's also available in the US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. As I said, because these are trained employees, they are not, it's not a free service, it's a subscription service. And at the moment, the cheapest subscription I could find is a 22 pounds per month for five minutes worth of calls. Now, I would just point out that this technology has been around a little while and actually recently they pretty much doubled their price. So there has been a little bit of um, unease by this in the vision hair community recently. Um, one of the things that people say is really good about this is it can do really specialist things. So for instance, if you were going out and about and you were needing some help with uh, navigating, through IRA they could actually uh, remote access your device and see where your GPS location is and provide guiding in real time. <laughs> They can also be, you know, online checking things out. One of the patients I saw recently said they'd bought a new um, audio recording system, some, some device to use at home, and they were able through Ira to tell them, this is the product I bought, I need to set it up. Ira can then go on, download the manual for that product and give really precise instructions. That's something that a volunteer or Be My Eyes course is not gonna be able to do. So there is a bit of a distinction between the type of help you can get through both of these facilities. Recently, I've actually come across a few cases where in the UK, the Access to Work uh, scheme, which is a government scheme for funding for assistive technology, well, assistance in the workplace, has actually funded subscriptions for people. So if you're in a position where you actually benefit from having um, personal assistance paid for through Access to Work, and you think something like this may work better in a sort of more independent way, you can ask within your Access to Work assessments whether they would consider covering this type of technology. So let's go to the next slide. So the last section of apps was really to talk about orientation and mobility. Now, 
the first thing I want to say about this is though technology is great, it does not replace the core skill of learning to use a cane or just your own mobility skills themselves. You don't just default to the app and the app does everything. The app is there to kind of augment or um, give you another layer of information around your own site that you're using and your mobility skills. And the other thing, again, about technology, it is great, but companies will bring out apps and they can discontinue them. So you don't want to be solely reliant on just one particular app. One example of this is actually Microsoft Soundscape. So this was an app that actually I mentioned when we last spoke on um, Zoom and many, many patients were using it. And then pretty much out of the blue at the end of last year, they announced that Microsoft were gonna discontinue it and you can no longer download it. And the people that are using it, it's actually gonna go offline in the summer this year. So not to be kind of really negative, but it's just to kind of keep in mind that these things don't completely take over from normal uh, you know, mobility skills and all the other rehab advice that you get. So if we go to the next slide, just a couple of, there are actually many, many of these apps around. Um, again, a couple of free ones that you can download, Lazarillo and Dot, Dot Walker. They can be used across Apple and Android, but Dot Walker is just Android. But essentially what they're doing is they're giving you additional audio information whilst you're on your journey. Now, of course, you can still use generic mobility apps or navigation apps like Google Maps, etc. But these um, apps that have been designed specifically with visual impairment in mind are kind of doing a little bit more. They're telling you about the street signs, they're telling you about the intersections, whether there's a bus stop, how far away it is, what are the points of interest around you. So they're there to give a sort of another level of audio information on your journey, a bit like audio description on a journey. One of the feedback that we get often is that these apps can sometimes run your battery down. So again, if you're gonna use it over a day, you've got a lot of sort of exploring to do, it's a good idea to make sure your battery is charged. So next one. All right, we're gonna move now more on to computers. So again, you've got all your inbuilt accessibility features there in much in the same way as you do with your smartphones and tablets. Um, a lot of people when they're using computers are going to use a mouse. A mouse is actually, or using a mouse is actually quite a visual task. You've got to see the cursor, you've got to see where you want to place the cursor, you've got the hand-eye coordination between the two. So there are ways of modifying that mouse pointer to make it more visible as well. And even something as simple as considering whether having a larger screen on an adjustable arm, so an arm that means you can bring the screen towards you, will give you more magnification just by proximity without having to fall into that trap of really poor posture by leaning into your screen for hours on end. Um, one thing to say is again, and this applies across all these devices, is using reversed contrast or black background with white text is often very, very good. And many people with central vision problems or a sort of central blind spot would anecdotally say that when they reverse the contrast, they're less aware of the impact of that scotoma or blind spot centrally. But really this is personal preference, you know, try it out. If it's working great, if not, it's fine. Let's move to the next slide. So again, with computers, as in with the uh, uh, tablets and um, smartphones, you've got speech output options as well. Again, in the same way, you can opt in and opt out. It doesn't mean that you have to use one exclusively, although some people do benefit much more from using one exclusively. And you'll have native screen readers already built into most mainstream computers. And of course, you do also have the option, much like you can put apps on your phone, you can download additional specialist software, and some of these softwares will cover additional magnification or speech or a combination of both. So if we move forward again. So I want to just talk a little bit more about speech and audio. And the reason I want to talk about it is because when I bring it up in clinic, especially for people who you know have maybe let's say a moderate visual impairment, even a mild visual impairment they can get a little bit resistant to the idea of using speech. And I just wanted to present it in a different way. So speech for me is just about flexibility. It's an option that you can pop in, use for a while and come right back out of if you don't want to use it all the time. Um, where could speech be useful? Just in the sense that, you know, everybody's eyes get tired through the day. So me as a fully sighted person, when I do a lot of written work at the end of the day, I'm not sure that I'm going to see all my mistakes when I'm proofreading. 
So I'll listen and I'll hear my mistakes and I'll hear them much, much easier than I'll see them. So just don't always think about speech as something that only people with very severe visual impairment rely on. Of course, it's gonna be really great in that scenario, but there's no reason to say you can't use it at any stage. So if you're doing prolonged reading, if your eyes are tired, as I say, brief reading, if you, you wanna just get quick access to something, then remember that have a little go at these options because they will already be there. And if you don't like them, of course, you don't need to use them, but just don't rule it out entirely. Let's go to the next slide. So just to talk you through the basics of this. So in a smartphone or tablet, you've usually got some selective speech options. So in Apple, they call it speak selection and in Android, they call it speak to screen. Now, I would say Apple is very easy to describe because you get the same settings across all the devices. Android is a little trickier because, you know, there is variability within the different Android platforms and different devices that you can have. But in general, you will find similar settings. You can also, um, instead of just selecting some text to be read, you can also just opt for that particular screen that you want to be read as well. Let's go forward. So even though you've got these um, options that are built into the um, phone and the tablet, you've also got options to have screen reading software as well. So this is, I guess, more thinking about using speech more as a, your standard way of accessing the device. So that software, screen reading software, is already available on most smartphones, well, Apple and Android smartphones. On Apple, it's called VoiceOver, and on TalkBack, it's called, sorry, on Android, it's called TalkBack. And the way that you interact with this software is either by learning gestures, by gestures, I mean things like tapping or swiping on a screen, or some people choose to use an additional keyboard, like a wireless keyboard with the device and use it that way. If we go to the next slide. On computers, you've also got these native inbuilt software. So on Apple, like iMacs, they've also, also got VoiceOver, but I would point out it's not the same as using VoiceOver on a phone. It is it actually the same name, but it's a different software. And on Windows, there's Windows Narrator. Now, Windows Narrator had a really bad press for a long time, but in the last few years has come on um, much, much more. And even beyond that, on Windows devices, there is the option to add even more specialist speech software. So again, like I said before about the difference between Apple and Android, Apple and Windows, Apple is what they call a walled garden. It's very difficult to put additional software on sometimes. Whereas with Windows, you've got more flexibility to add uh, additional uh, specialist software. So if we go forward again, so some of the additional software that you can add on that's just useful to know about is um, one's called NVDA, Non-Visual Desktop Access. And this is actually a free software program. It's open access. It was developed by I think two young men who are computer programmers who uh, were born blind. And they've got lots of great resources on their website to download and also to purchase. Um, now, there, that will have a huge, that will have more functionality than the native screen readers that are inbuilt on, say, a Windows device or an Apple device. Some people also opt to have an additional or a, a, um, a kind of more, what would you call it, like the gold standard screen reader, which is called JAWS, you may have heard of, which stands for Job Access and Speech. This is more expensive. You have to buy a subscription. Often businesses will buy that subscription. And they often say things like, this is for a power user of a screen reader. So it, it really is like the most advanced level of screen reading. But people who are using, um, doing a lot of computer work in their job can get um, funding to get uh, JAWS software and also uh, support in training how to, on, on how to use it. So if we go to the next slide. Just to say about screen readers, it's great for me to you know, casually drop this in. Oh yeah, give speech a go, but it's not a quick thing. It takes time. You've got to be um, practicing to become proficient. For those in the UK, it's always worth asking your local authority if they're offering any training. If it's through employment, as I say, Access to Work will usually offer training for this type of um, screen reading software, but there are some really good free resources online as well. So you may have come across the hadley.edu website. Hadley's a based in America and they're a visual impairment charity and they have a lot of really great free workshops online. 
They have a technology section, but it also covers lots of other kind of everyday living skills as well. But they've got a series of workshops on TalkBack, on VoiceOver, and on Windows Narrator as well. So if you're thinking about exploring the options of speech, this is a good place to start. And I think it's always worth trying this on devices you already own. Don't go out and you know, spend a lot of money on a subscription for a fancy screen reader only to find out that it wasn't necessary or you thought it was, you know, didn't really suit what you needed. So if we go to the next slide, briefly just want to talk about keyboard skills if you're thinking about uh, screen reading software, because the fundamental skill to using screen reading software is to be able to navigate your keyboard as well as possible because you interact with the computer through a range of keyboard commands or shortcuts, which is essentially combinations of keys to produce a specific function. And even for those who aren't using screen readers, it's just a really good way to release you from the reliance on the mouse, which as I said, is a very visual and a taxing task. So if you have a little look, you can bookmark shortcutworld.com because it has all of the shortcuts for many, many, many ordinary software programs across Apple and Mac. So it's a good one just to kind of bookmark so you know where to find all these shortcuts. But I would also consider, even if you're not thinking around using speech, to learn to touch type if you haven't already. And again, there are lots of uh, free um, web-based packages online where you can do that training. And even if you're not thinking around, um, you know, you're not super techy and you just want to improve your access to the keyboard, there is, of course, just modified and large print keyboards as well. So if we go forward, this is my last little bit. Um, I wanted to talk briefly about wearable electronic magnifiers because it's something that we get asked about a lot in the, the low vision clinic. They're not currently funded by the NHS. They're a completely sort of private um, option. Now, they've actually been around for quite a long time, even from the 1990s. They were very big and bulky at that point. Now we're able to have smaller, lighter, more versatile devices, which is really good. But there's still limited clinical research around these devices. So I do urge a little bit of caution around it before anyone wants to rush out and buy a particular device. What we do know is that if you put one of these devices on, because you're going to magnify the image in front of you, we can definitely measure better visual function on clinical measures of vision. But what we don't know is how well that translates into the real world for the majority of people. And of course, there will be lots of differences between people and their preferences and what they want to use these devices for. We also know that they're not necessarily acceptable to everybody yet. About half of people that try them tend not to find them acceptable for a range of reasons. That might be that they're too big and bulky. It might be that they just don't do what they wanted it to do. You know, they, sometimes people want it to do things that it's just not capable of doing. Um, some people find that they actually get a bit motion sick when they wear them because they're looking at this image very close to their eyes. So if we really need to know how useful they are, we need to understand more how they help people in real world tasks. We go forward again. But generally, all of these devices have sort of commonality. So you've got a thumb sort of headset, and then you'll have an externally mounted camera on that headset, and that's going to image the world in front. And then you can, through either an app or buttons on the device or through a little handset, adjust things like the magnification, the contrast, the focus. Some of them will have additional imaging processing for extra contrast or AI or um, augmented reality to sort of bring out certain features and maximize particular viewing conditions. We go on again. In general, they basically fall into two categories at the moment. So you've got these bigger devices that are based on commercially available tech. So things like uh, virtual reality headsets. Now these tend to be a little bit less expensive because they're using commercially available tech. They are a bit more bulky. They are a goggle that is really enclosing right around your eyes. So you're blocking out all of your peripheral vision. So really they're only gonna be helpful under stationary conditions. You're not gonna be able to walk around with these. But interestingly, when I was speaking recently to some of the suppliers of this technology in um, central vision loss patients, they find that these bigger bulkier devices actually tend to do a bit better than some of the sleeker ones because you've got the benefit of having a large screen. So that means that you can actually use your eccentric viewing a lot easier on a device like this than you might be able to do on, let's go to the next slide, devices like this where you've got these smaller, fully integrated screens inside. So even though these devices 
with the smaller screens and these fully integrated screens are potentially sleeker and don't block as much peripheral vision, they may not necessarily give you the same sort of a microfunctional benefit. And these devices also do tend to be a little bit more expensive. If we go on to the next slide. So just if you're thinking to go down this route, just think, are there any alternatives first that you can get through ordinary generic tech that's not gonna cost you loads more money? Find out, can it actually do what you want? So like, what is your motivation behind it? And also, where is the motivation coming from? Because a lot of times we get patients, it's actually really well-meaning family and friends that want to drive that agenda of trying some of these devices. And I've even had it where it's really upset some younger children who want to try them because they think, well, why, why do I have to wear this big thing on my face? It's a bit old and I don't really want to. So even though these things exist, just don't, rush through and really think carefully about what it could do and could it help and a good way of doing this is to find out if you can get a no obligation home demonstration because really that's when you're going to put it to the test in the environment you want to use it in so one company for this i just wanted to mention is vision aid their details are on the next slide and the reason i've highlighted this company is just that they're independent of all the suppliers so they will actually come to you and bring a range of the different wearable devices because some are going to be better than others and there's going to be a huge amount of personal preference. And then just next slide, I think I'm going to finish with just a couple of resources. So Hadley, I mentioned already, please do check out their website. They've got lots of great workshops. The next one is AbilityNet. This is a charity in the UK that are, by promoting digital accessibility across a wide range of um, disabilities, and they're happy to be contacted for um, individual problems, you know, queries that someone has, as are the RNIB on the next slide, they've got an RNIB technology for life team. Again, you can email and have queries you know, to, to discuss with them. And then was it another one? Yes, for the very techy people, the TABIP, so Technology Association for the Visually Impaired, for visually impaired People. They're excellent. I recently got in touch with them. Someone will have a query about using spreadsheets with um, screen reading technology. And I'm a sighted person. I don't use this technology. I'm not gonna know the answers to all of these things. So it's really great to be able to learn off of the vision impaired community, it's people who especially who are very, very tech minded. And I think that might be it. No podcast, really great podcasts that are all cover lots of this. Double tap, RNIB Tech Talk, Sight and Sign Technology, and Hadley presents if you are interested to do that too. Sorry, Abby. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then I think I'm definitely finished. Yes. I'm <laughs> I um, also just would like to apologize uh, to those of us who are online because we took the slides. Um, I saw lots of people taking photographs. We will share Hannah's slides with all of you after the conference. So you will have all those links, you'll have all that information. Um, Hannah's talk will also go online eventually as well, so you'll be able to listen to Hannah do this a thousand times over if you, <laughs> if you want to. Are there any questions in the room for Hannah, either about anything she said or maybe a piece of tech that you use that Hannah hasn't mentioned that you think could be good that you'd like to share? Raya? Thank you. There's a couple of questions <laughs> online. Um, one of the questions is that one of the greatest difficulties we with vision impairment have is in recognizing faces oh. and what is the best technology to use for that. I don't think there's a perfect one. That's probably the, the short answer. Some of the applications I mentioned will do um, person recognition where if you have already told the device or the app who the person is, it can recognize them. But of course that doesn't work in incidental situations where you need to meet someone. There's also another device called Orcam that has the same sort of facility. I think where you might learn or where we might get benefit in the future is, like I mentioned about this um, image processing through the newest version of ChatGPT. So devices like, um, there's an end vision glasses that basically use AI to describe the world. Again, they're also partnering with ChatGPT. So I think that's probably where it's gonna go technology-wise to be able to do that in a, in a, a way that really complements how we live our lives. Thank you for that. And there's just one other comment being made 
somebody online is saying that they use Fusion and they just wanted to mention that in case other people found it useful. Are there any other questions, any other questions from in the room? No? Well, uh, before we give a clap panel off, <laughs> we'd just like to give a little thank you from, from Starbucks Connected. <laughs> Now we'll be around for a little bit today. So if you have questions, if you want to touch Hannah, or and Hannah's already open to hear about anything she used that you know what moves. Yes, because I will see it. <laughs> that can it find its way to the presentation to be shared. Because I consider that because before I consider the person, I can't see the description, you know. Shalini, do you want to just wave? This is Shalini. If anyone wants to know about Max TV, yeah. hunt her out at lunchtime. <laughs> Thank you. No, this is why we wanted to do this event, and this is why we wanted an in-person and a virtual aspect to it, so that people could do exactly this, share what they know. Thank you very much, everybody. So, oh, we've got one last question there. Go on. Yeah, so look at what's inbuilt first. Which Can I just add one? Yeah, go on. Um, I should have said it on the slide. If you want to look at all your own devices and their inbuilt features, go to the AbilityNet website. They've got a page called My Computer, My Way. You put in your operating system, there's little drop downs, you put in Vision, and then it spurts out all of the accessibility features for that particular operating system. And that's just a good repository of all that information, but it will vary so much across the place. So, Hannah, that's AbilityNet? Yeah, it's on the slide. It's on the slide. So, <laughs> go to AbilityNet and find out all about your device and everything that's inbuilt in it. Lovely. Thank you ever so much. So, lunch. Uh, so, we are giving, we're going to give uh, a shout out to Chef David Rolls, uh, who we have been working with for a number of years now. He has come along today. He's been running a cooking session with our children and young people, um, but he is formerly uh, uh, the personal chef of Richard Branson, um, and he has been working and doing cooking sessions with people with vision impairment for years, and he has very kindly catered this whole event to um, lunchtime for us today. So we have a, a feast of vegetarian and vegan food for, for us, and Everyone who has shared allergen information, we have taken that into account in the menu, so there are no allergy issues. Um, so uh, our young people have prepared one or two of the dishes along with David under his strict supervision today. <laughs> so I hope you will. I hope you'll enjoy the, the offering. Oh, he, the children have made the uh, vegetarian sushi and the fruit skewer. So um, the last thing to say in this lunch break please use this time to get to know each other a little bit more. Uh, if you haven't done so yet, you can still buy tickets to the raffle for this afternoon. Uh, we Please go and visit our exhibitors. We've got some great exhibitors, lots of great information, some cool tech devices to try out on site today. And please do go to our flip charts and please do share your thoughts and opinions. Starbucks Connected has to work for you. So the more you tell us about what you want to need, the more we can help to support you in that. I think that's everything, Barbara? Yep. Wonderful. Perfect. So enjoy lunch. We will reconvene in about two o'clock. So enjoy your time. And once again, just remind you, if you do want to go outside, you are welcome, but please do not take food. If you're online, thank you so much. And we will uh, see you again in about an hour. Thank you.